Ink Ribbon. From technology to pharmaceuticals, we have several companies in the real world who seemingly have control of entire global markets. Thankfully, none of these companies are evil enough to make people sprout multiple giant eyeballs or be involved with an entire city being literally bombed. Today we're going to take a closer look at the infamous company from the Resident Evil universe that is responsible for so much destruction and death. From worldwide bases to an assortment of products, here are 50 facts about the Umbrella Corporation. The origins of Umbrella and their evil ways go back as far as the 1960s, with a lot of early research being inspired by the eugenics movements happening in Europe and North America. The three key founding members of Umbrella were Oswell Spencer, Edward Ashford, and James Marcus. In Resident Evil 5, we learned of a fourth founding member, a man named Brandon Bailey, who was a virologist and a protege of James Marcus. Unlike the other three members, he faked his death and went into hiding. As of 2017, the BSAA was unable to confirm his death, and he may still be alive. Marcus, Spencer, and Bailey all went to West Africa and set up a camp and spent three months analyzing a rare breed of flowers they found in a series of caverns. These flowers were dubbed Progenitor and were the base ingredient for making what would eventually be the T-Virus. The first discovery of the regenerative abilities of the flower were found when they added chlorine to it in a petri dish to kill it and then noticed it began to repair itself even after it was dead. Umbrella has also created some very unique and powerful weapons, like the Linear Launcher, which is a shoulder-mounted cannon that fires a ball of plasma. James Marcus was a very strict and serious boss, as demonstrated by his employee motto. Obedience breeds discipline. Discipline breeds unity. Unity breeds power. Power is life. <laughs> Umbrella has several of its own paramilitary units, including Umbrella Security Service, aka Hunk's Team, and Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Force, or UBCS, which was Carlos and Nikolai's team. Within the UBCS was a second set of employees dubbed Monitors. These were higher-ups who would report back to Umbrella and included Tyrell and Nikolai, as well as Vladimir Sergei from Umbrella Chronicles. In Code Veronica, we get to have our only ever look inside the Paris Umbrella Labs during the opening cutscene. There is actually another Europe lab in France, dubbed Laboratory 6. This lab is where Luis Serra primarily worked and where the Nemesis project occurred. Also in Code Veronica was the reveal of an Antarctic umbrella base, owned and operated by the Ashford family. In Umbrella Chronicles, Jill and Chris team up once again and head to yet another Umbrella facility, this time located in Russia. This was their final mission against Umbrella as it's the catalyst for proving Umbrella's actions to the government. The Russian base is home to UMF-013, which is a supercomputer that houses all of Umbrella's archives as well as the Red Queen and her counterpart, the White Queen. While this is the only mention of the Red Queen from the movies, Umbrella Chronicles is canon, so there you go. In the manga series Biohazard Heavenly Island, we learn of yet another base on Sonida de Tortuga Island, which translates to Sound of a Turtle Island. Do turtles make sounds? This was originally a military base owned by the U.S. government, but was abandoned until the 90s when the base was purchased by Umbrella and converted into a laboratory. Even though Raccoon City is where the most notorious Umbrella facilities were located, the USA headquarters for Umbrella is actually based in Chicago. The Umbrella logo, unsurprisingly, is modeled after an umbrella. I tried to find the origins of the classic white and red umbrella, but I couldn't find anything specific to it. In Resident Evil 3's Mercenaries mode, a mysterious man in a chair will give your character their reward. Presumably, he's an executive of some kind for Umbrella, but his model is actually just a blacked out model of Chief Irons. The MoDisc model contains the logo for a company called Parasol. This is both a subsidiary of Umbrella and another word for it. Umbrella sells a wide variety of products in several categories. Among their medicines are Safsprin, which is a pain reliever similar to aspirin, and its slogan is The Common Cure. 
Adraville, which is most likely a parody of Advil, is a pain relieving paste. Usperim is yet another pain reliever offered to Alyssa in her good ending in Outbreak. Aquacure is an ointment that helps heal wounds quickly and is primarily marketed towards women. It's worth mentioning it's one of Umbrella's most popular products. I won't make this whole list about their products, but it is worth mentioning we've seen that they sell everything from clothing to cosmetics and even food, as seen by the Umbrella Noodles, first appearing as an Outbreak SP item. One of Umbrella's subsidiaries is a cruise line named Paraguas, which is Umbrella in Spanish. The company owned several cruise ships that doubled as BOW transportation, including the Queen Zenobia from Revelations. In Resident Evil Degeneration, we learn of a new pharmaceutical company called Will Pharma. Well, it turns out there's a real-life company, also called Will Pharma, and Capcom agreed to remove all logos and references to their company in the future. There are also two instances of real-life companies using the Umbrella logo, but it's most likely due to them not realizing its origin. First is a Vietnamese skin center using the literal logo from the games, and after going viral, removed most of the photos from their website. This was confirmed when a few social media sleuths tracked down the location to verify that it was indeed real. The other instance was, interestingly, a Shanghai biotech company, though their logo was green instead of red. Because these images went viral in January of 2020, and due to the company's location being 800 kilometers to Wuhan, there were several conspiracy theories that this company created the pandemic, some even claiming that it was in an effort to emulate Umbrella the way it's present in the games. This has all been fact-checked and is completely false, of course. To promote the second Resident Evil film, a fake Umbrella commercial for an anti-aging serum was produced. I would bet that if Umbrella focused on anti-aging instead of bioweapons, they would make much, much more money. Always consult your doctor before starting treatment. Some side effects may occur. In the Resident Evil films, Umbrella is just as present as they are in the games. During the ending scene of the film, when Alice is walking the streets of a destroyed Raccoon City, there is an Umbrella advertisement on the side of a bus that reads, At Umbrella Medical, we try to make Teddy a little bit softer. One of the biggest differences between Umbrella in the games and in the movies is the prevalence of human cloning, something that is a main focus in the films but never happens in the games. And yes, that includes Ada in Resident Evil 6. Something I found funny while researching, in the third movie, after the world is nearly destroyed from the pandemic, the employees at Umbrella are revealed to be meeting virtually, which is exactly how we ended up after our pandemic going into Zoom calls. Umbrella maintains a strong control over Raccoon City, bribing both the mayor and the chief of police. The mayor would launder large amounts of money for Umbrella, while the police chief would allow crimes to be covered up and investigations to be closed. One of the biggest ways that Umbrella controlled the city was through the Bright Raccoon 21 project, where Umbrella donated a huge amount of money to renovate several parts of the city, including restoring the clock tower and upgrading the police station and police force, which included adding the newly formed STARS unit. One of Umbrella's newer scientists was a man named John Clemens. He worked at the Chicago branch, and during his time there, he formed a relationship with Ada Wong. He then transferred to the Arclay Mansion, where he ended up getting infected and dying. He had such strong feelings for her that he made her name his password, never knowing that she was just using him for information. One of Umbrella's top researchers was Annette Birkin, a virologist who was hired in the 80s and worked under William Birkin to assist him in the G-Virus project, eventually marrying him and having a daughter together. William Birkin was one of the top researchers for Umbrella, being invited by Dr. Marcus to join an executive training program alongside Albert Wesker. Birkin ended up creating the G-Virus, which was as powerful as it was unstable. When Umbrella tried to steal the research from him, he injected himself just before dying, becoming an unstoppable bioweapon himself. Albert Wesker began his career working for Umbrella as a researcher and even became a test subject himself before ultimately betraying Umbrella as well as the STARS team and pretty much every other person and organization he's ever worked with. 
By the end of Resident Evil 7, we are introduced to Blue Umbrella, which is a byproduct of the BSAA. This was a new company that was specifically created to clean up Umbrella's mess and turn things around, essentially an anti-Umbrella. The reason for keeping Umbrella in the name is to make sure the public are constantly reminded of Umbrella's actions. The biggest crime ever committed was their involvement in the destruction of Raccoon City. While they were responsible for the outbreak that brought the city to the brink, they actually tried to stop it from being bombed. The ironic thing about Umbrella trying to delay a bombing is that it's a common feature in all their facilities to initiate a self-destruct sequence which destroys all experiments and evidence. Halfway through Code Veronica, we get to see the aftermath of a self-destruct system, showing that the facility was badly damaged but not completely destroyed. It's not clear why this is the case because at the end of the game the Antarctic base is completely vaporized. Senator Ron Davis, who we meet in the Degeneration film, and Derek Simmons, who we met in Resident Evil 6, were both the ones who suggested and approved the bombing of Raccoon City, to which Umbrella protested for more time but at that point had lost all influence over elected officials. In 2003, the biggest lawsuit against Umbrella began, dubbed the Raccoon Trials. Among key witnesses and testimony were Yoko Suzuki and Linda Baldwin from Resident Evil Outbreak. Umbrella was extremely close to covering up their crimes, claiming lack of evidence. On top of this, they used the help of false witnesses, destroyed evidence, and put the blame on the US government, but at the last moment of the trials, a man made a secret deal with the courts and provided Umbrella archives that proved their involvement. The deal was that the archives could never be shown to the public in order to protect the public. The man who made that deal and double-crossed Umbrella was none other than Albert Wesker. After this verdict was delivered, not only did Umbrella go bankrupt, but both American and Russian intelligence began an international manhunt for Marcus Spencer, who had long since gone into hiding with the intent of arresting him. In 2004, after losing every case against it and going bankrupt, the final branches of Umbrella in Japan tried to sell the company but failed. After this, they declared their final bankruptcy and they were liquidated. It took quite a few years, but it looks like Jill was right. It's true that once the wheels of justice begin to turn, nothing can stop them. Nothing. So as the Resident Evil franchise stands now, Umbrella is no more and we probably won't see them again, but they had a good run. And by good, I mean evil. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to sensually rub some AquaCure into that like button. If there's another 50 Facts video you'd like to see, leave it down in the comments and it may be a future video. I hope you have a great day. Until next time, I'm Kai Morgan, and as always, thanks for watching Ink Ribbon. And a very special thank you to all of my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Your extra support means the world to me and helps me keep making content for you guys.